Before we start this show, just a word from our sponsor. 20 by 20 Apparel. Founded in 2015, 20 by 20 Apparel brings original tributes to pro wrestling's classic arenas, moments, and events. They look to spotlight the bloopers, bleeps, and body slams along with the biggest, smallest, strangest, and strongest that pro wrestling has had to offer. Along with their awesome line of pro wrestling apparel, they do offer many services. In the world of wrestling, there are hundreds of shirts, promotions, flyers, social media accounts, and ads. Don't get lost in the sea of parody shirts and display fonts. They can provide professional graphic design services at a reasonable price. 20 by 20 also hand screen prints all the tees in-house. If you would like to discuss possible run of tees, posters, koozies, foam fingers, or whatever, drop them a line. Go to 20 by 20 apparel. That's the number 20 X, the number 20 apparel.com. Now let's get to the show. Fresh is the word. I'm Jim Duggan, got long wood for plenty hoes. I keep it fresher than fresh, but you already know. You suck as bummy, I'm money, I got a ton of flows. My weed loud like a motherfucking thunder roll. Your shit quiet like you ballin' on a budget though. We see your kicks and we laugh and yell the what it goes. You see me shining like a suit on puffy. You know my grind and shit is too strong, buddy. That's why the dude call money. I be stuntin' like it's nothing at all. Cause it's nothing to me, it's probably something to y'all. Trying to smoke like me, then come and fuck with your dog. Got a closet full of kicks, you can't cop it the mall. And I'm fresher than the freshest, you can tell it's in my essence. Bitch, you see the way I'm rapping? Yes, I do this shit to death. I tell I'm running out of breath. I tell somebody cut a check. But either way, you know it's fresh. But either way, you know it's fresh. Fresh. We fresh. 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 God damn it, we fresh. Welcome to the Fresh is the Word podcast. I'm your host, Kelly K. Fresh Frazier, and this is episode 97. And this week's guest is stand-up comedian, writer, podcaster, and actress, Rosie Tron. As you may have remembered, she was suggested by BJ Mendelson back on episode number 89. Originally from New Orleans, Hollywood is her home now, and she has performed in comedy venues both locally and internationally. She also hosts a couple of podcasts, including the Hello Crypto Kitty podcast with fellow comedian Esther Ku and the Out of the Box podcast. During our conversation, we talked about her move from New Orleans to Los Angeles, how she got into comedy, the difference between a sense of humor and real comedy, the mental health aspects of being a comic, crafting her material, perseverance, the roles of Asian women and women in general in comedy, political correctness in the Me Too movement, and her podcasts. So let's get on to the interview with Rosie Tron. Yeah, I see that you were uh, originally from uh, New Orleans. Why did you make the, the trip from uh, New Orleans to L.A. to become an entertainer? What was, the, what was your goal? Well, unfortunately, um, New Orleans, the comedy scene there now is growing, and, and it's awesome. But when I was living there, the scene you know, was very small. And, um, you know, New Orleans has grown into quite an entertainment hub. You know, a lot of times people call it Hollywood South, or they call it Atlanta Hollywood South, because a lot of production has moved there. But when I was growing up there, definitely there was not that much of an entertainment scene. So I felt like I had to move to New York or Los Angeles to make things happen. <laughs> when did you first sort of get the, the bug that you wanted to be some sort of an entertainer? Um, I would say in college, you know, growing up, I was definitely really, really shy and I didn't have any entertainment background, but actually that's really common. Like a lot of the comedians I know and actors I know grow up, a lot of people think that if you want to be an entertainer, you're like really outgoing and like crazy and all this other stuff. But, um, I I've noticed that most of the entertainers that I know, you know, grew up being really shy and kind of wanting to express themselves. So, um, I was dating a guy who wanted to be a comedian and, um, I would go with him to his shows and he, he was funny, but he wasn't that funny. And I would always <laughs> tell him to rework his jokes. I was like, why don't you say it like this? Or why don't you say it like that? And, 
And I was kind of like the grumpy girlfriend tag along. I would go to all the shows and just sit in the back and be grumpy because I did not like stand up. I was like, this is awful. I don't like this. Like, why are you doing this? And then um, he would always say, well, you should try to be a comedian. I was like, why? And he's like, because you're always here at my shows and you're just like, you know, sitting in the corner frowning. You might as well write five minutes of jokes or whatever. And I was like, whatever, you're crazy. (laughs) And (laughs) yeah, so then after we broke up, I actually missed going out to see comedy all the time. So I went out and I was like, all right, maybe I'll try this. And like I said, I was very shy growing up. So I was like, let me just try this. And I tried it and I loved it. So, and you know, usually the first few years that you do stand up, you're not that funny. And I was okay. I wasn't, you know, that great, but I I felt definitely very comfortable on stage and I really liked it. So, um, that's something that takes people years and years to become comfortable on stage. And I was like comfortable the first second I was on stage. So I was like, wow, maybe I was meant to do this. (laughs) When you were uh, going to those those nights with your, your boyfriend at the time, and you felt like, oh, this is really awful, was it because there just wasn't anybody that that you resonated with when you were looking at, you know, watching all these comedians do their uh, stand up sets? Well, that's definitely, you know, that's a good point. I never thought of it that way, actually. Even though I've been doing stand up for over ten years, but now that you mentioned it, Kelly, um, yeah, I I think it was, you know, the scene is still heavily in, you know, white and male. And, uh, but it was even more so, you know, 10 years ago, definitely white and male. And, um, it, it, you know, comedy has definitely evolved a lot now to have more diverse voices and, and more women, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, when I started, it was more, you know, Dane Cook was really popular. It was more of like a frat boy type of humor. Oh yeah. So I, I never thought of it that way, but I guess that could be one of the reasons. But I think I just, you know, I just didn't know what it was. I never was really into it. Even now, you know, like my, my parents, they're not that respectful of comedy. They're supportive, but they're, they still don't really understand it. And, you know, my sister told me one time, she said, you know, I really think if they understood how much work and writing and creativity and like hustle and everything that you do, like they would really respect it. Cause she's like, you do a lot. Like, I think a lot of people think comedians just get up there and just start talking, but it takes years and years and hours and hours and hours to like craft jokes and write them and rewrite them. And, and, um, so it's definitely, I think I just didn't really understand what it was. And I, and you know, I don't think I was seeing that really that good of comedy because unfortunately he was an amateur. So I was, um, not really exposed to, to better comedy. When you were first starting to do your own comedy, you know, what was it that, was there anything that you can pinpoint that, you know, finally locked in to where you're like, oh, I like this. I like doing it. Was there an aspect of it that made you sort of fall in love with it? So I liked comedy right away. And I liked that it was um, something that you could control. No, so that, that makes me sound like a control freak. But it, um, so when you're an actor and you do a performance, you really have no idea whether the performance is good or not until you see the film or the TV show or the product. And it can be sometimes three or four months, even years until you see the product. You know, there's independent films that took years to get made. So you really have no feedback. You're just performing. But with comedy, there's instant feedback, right? If you're funny, people laugh. If you're not funny, people don't laugh. (laughs) So you get this instant feedback And you kind of go into a state of instant creativity. You know, I honestly think stand up comedy, even though unfortunately, you know, it's not very respected as far as um, entertainment. A lot of people in the entertainment community really expect high, you know, respect high art, quote unquote. You know, if you went to theater school at Yale or whatever, Juilliard, right, that's considered you're very serious. You're a serious actor or actress and. And that's very highly respected. But I honestly think comedy is the, you know, maybe, maybe music, you know, I would say music, an independent artist could be equivalent, you know, I'll give I I think they're on the same plane, but anything where you are the entertainment, you, you know, when you see a comedian, typically, there is no, you know, crazy fireworks on stage, there's no set, it's just one person and their thoughts, and their ideas and a microphone. You know, the same thing with a musician. If you see someone playing it like an acoustic guitar, it's just that person and the guitar. And they are providing entertainment for an hour or whatever, however long their show is. You know, when you watch a film, 
this is like a million dollar budget with actors and sets and directors just to provide that same level of entertainment. So it is, you know, uh, comedians and, and musicians, we are very, very, um, I guess, multitaskers. And it's a very pure, pure form of entertainment. I think it really, I really wish it would get more respect than it does. But I think a lot of people think of comedy as very silly. You know, it comes back to clowning. A lot of people, you know, relate it to, to being a clown, which is not very well respected. Right. So there's these roots of lack of respect of like, you know, coming from the theater days of like, you know, the, 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 the imbecile or the clown or whatever. So the roots are very disrespected. Yet if you look at the actual creativity, the actual art, it's very high art, very, very high art. And in addition to that, some of the greatest actors of all time, comedic and serious have all said stand ups too hard for them. I've heard it in multiple interviews. Oh, you know, definitely. Yeah, you, you know, Will Ferrell is one of, you know, the great, you know, comedic actors has said he couldn't do stand up. He quit stand up. It was just too hard. So it's just really bizarre to me that it's kind of a a more lower respected art form in the scheme of entertainment when it's actually the hardest and most difficult and most, you know, along with music, like I said, one of the most skilled and crafted art forms. It's just really really bizarre. But um the moment to answer your question, I kind of went off on a tangent that I, I realized was almost immediately because I got that instant feedback and, and then you can change it. You can work on your jokes. You can, it's, a, it's actually, I made a mistake by saying it was an art. It's actually not an art. It's a craft because you can work on it and become funnier. And any comedian will tell you that. And, you know, sometimes people watch someone, they go, Oh, this guy's just naturally funny. You know, eh, that's a lie this guy, <laughs> that you see that you think is naturally funny has probably been working on his act for, you know, 20 years. <laughs> kind of, you know, when it comes to sort of that idea of a craft and with sort of the way technology is, you know, these days, you sort of have a lot of people who, you know, who who say shitty things and try to mask it as as, you know, a joke or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And. I'm all for people having a sense of humor, but there is a difference between have a sen having a sense of humor and then crafting real comedy. You know, what, what do you think is the difference between having a sense of humor and real comedy? So I'm so glad you asked that, Kelly, but the line is razor thin. There is a razor thin line, and that's why it's comedy is so hard because – and, and it's also based upon the viewer. It's very subjective because someone can watch a, a comedic bit or hear a joke and say, oh, my God, that is the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. And someone else can hear it and say, that is really offensive. You know, that's not cool that the person said that. Right. So because when you're doing comedy, you're making fun of something. You're making light of something. And usually, you know, it's something serious, you know. So obviously you can make fun of silly things. You know, you can make fun of social media and, you know, with celebrities and all that stuff. But that's kind of superficial. And a lot of co comedians are thinkers, right? Like I said, a lot of us are shy and we're thinkers and observers. Right. And so most comics want to make fun of something meaningful. And that's why political comedy is, you know, really big right now because they really want to say something. They really want to have a voice. And so that's where that razor thin line goes. And I, you know what? I can't tell you where that line is because the, the line is in – the eye of the beholder, you know, look at Michelle Wolf. She just did the correspondence dinner for the white house, you know, and there was all this controversy that she was so offensive and, you know, some people found her offensive and awful. And some people were like, Oh my God, she went there. She's crazy and hilarious and bold. And, you know, so it's that line is unfortunately in, you know, the eye of the beholder and, and, you know, there's comedians that I, I see that people are like, Oh my God, this person is so funny. And I'm like, eh, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm sure you have the same thing where you see comedians and you think, eh, they're not that good. And then there's certain people that maybe you think are so funny. And then maybe your sister or your brother or your mom would be like, I find them kind of, you know, off putting or crude. So it's really, you're, you're trying to find your audience and that's, that's not always easy, you know, especially if you're not doing the mainstream thing, you know, if you want to say something really, really important, you're not going to have, you know, the most fans, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's definitely a sliding scale of where that line is. You mentioned a few times how about how when you were younger and even, you know, even probably now that how you're a bit shy and a lot of the other comedians 
are, you know, just internally, inherently shy people. And something that sort of came out of all that, you know, with what you were sort of saying about, you know, finally, you know, starting to, you know, do comedy is that like there's, you know, what is sort of like the mental health aspect of being a comic? You know, how does that sort of help it? Or is there anything that's a detriment to your, uh, to the health, the mental health aspect of any comedian? So that is a really, 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 really good question. And also a controversial question. So, you know, most people have an idea. So there's, there's, there's a split. So a lot of people have this idea that comedians are always goofy and silly and happy and all that stuff, right? Because they're like making jokes. And as we are learning more about mental health, we know, you know, maybe that's not exactly true with people like Robin Williams committing suicide and other comedians, you know, dealing with mental health issues. We say, well, you know, that's, that's not true. Actually, you know, someone can, can have a big smile on their face and really be suffering behind closed doors. But then there's another aspect of that where I, you know, I know that there's this, also a stereotype that a lot of comedians have mental issues and everything. But I would actually say that I think that the comedian population accurately reflects uh, the overall population. And that what well, I think that what I'm saying right now is very controversial because I think the stereotypes have been very bipolar saying, well, comedians are either depressed and manic or comedians are happy all the time. <laughs> I think that it really reflects. The overall, you know, I know a lot of comedians that are, are that struggle with mental health issues, but you know what? I know a lot of comedians, including myself, who are very healthy because we're always expressing ourselves. You know, I used to work as in a day job in an office and, you know, everyone at my office like seemed depressed. And I thought, <laughs> oh, my God, these people really need to talk about their problems. And so a lot of comedians and entertainers have that outlet where we can express ourselves. And unfortunately, Kelly, a lot of people that are living very normal average lives, they don't have that, you know, um, outlet to express themselves. So I would actually say a lot of the comedians I know are more healthy than your average Joe because they're expressing themselves all the time. And so taking that into account and knowing, you know, the comedians I know that are also mentally ill and have mental health issues, I would just say that, the you know, comedians that I know just reflect the general population. There's, you know, one thing I was like thinking about with all of this is that, um, you know, I go see a therapist for, you know, things that I'm going through. And recently my therapist That's was, awesome. well, yeah, was mentioning how a lot of the people that, um, she, you know, a lot of her patients for, you know, to deal with sort of like, let's say like dealing with failure, uh, learning how to deal with failure, they will do something, um, like go do an improv uh, set, you know, go find somewhere that, where they can do improv. That mean, you know, they can be in front of people. They might suck at it first, but they can learn that it'll be cool. It's okay. It's, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. And it's a, it's a healthy way of being able to, you know, work with these, you know, mental problems that they're having and do it in a bit of a fun way. And if you suck, you suck, whatever. It's okay. And that's another reason I kind of, I, like I said, I would, I just would kind of say the general population because I know comedians that are extremely depressed. I, I definitely know comedians that are extremely depressed, but I also know a lot of comedians that are really, really well adjusted. And I think, like you said, we're constantly dealing with failure. And like I mentioned in the very beginning of our podcast, you know, it's instant feedback. If one of my jokes sucks, I know right away, Hey, that wasn't <laughs> funny. Okay. <laughs> so I'm constantly dealing with failure and rejection. And if you choose as an entertainer to take that on as a positive, then you actually can be healthier than the average person. But if you take that on as a personal attack on yourself, which I also know a lot of comedians who do, you know, I know comedians that if they have a bad set or they, they're not funny that night, you know, they take it real personal and say, I suck. I'm awful. I'm horrible. You know, I'm going to go kill myself. I'm, you know, I, I'm just awful. I'm a loser. And if you take that mentality then, you know, you're not going to be in the best mental health. And like I said, I, I tend to think that would reflect the general population because I know tons of non-comedians and I know non-comedians that take things very personal. And then I know non-comedians that, you know, take things with a stride. So I, I think that what I'm saying right now is very controversial that the comedian you know, the comedy community reflects the general population because I think the stereotype in the past has been comedians are either very depressed or very you know, happy, goofy, whatever, all the time. So I would say it's a, it's a mix. 
How do you take those failures and turn them into a positive, into a challenge? I think it's just a mindset. You know, when I first started doing comedy, I did take things more personal. You know, I did internalize and connect more with my bad shows and say, hey, this is a reflection of me. But then what I started to do is I started to practice, you know, spirituality. And I, I went to a therapist and I got mentally healthy. And now, you know what, when I go to a show, I have fun no matter what. And so every show that I go to is a win. However, if I have jokes that aren't funny or that don't hit, I take it as a learning experience. And how can I write this joke to make it funnier? But what I do is I, I take myself out of myself. So a lot of people, they take things very personal. They take it as their identity. And you have to separate your act from who you are. And, and, and how can you do that? Just think of yourself as someone else, right? Like, let's look at Madonna, right? So I, I'll look at Madonna. I love Madonna. I think she's a great performer. But I'm not going to like every single song that she does. That would just be insane. Right. I would just be a manic fan. So that's how you have to look at yourself, you know. Um, you're a rapper. Is that true? Oh, no, uh, no, I'm a DJ. A, DJ, DJ. And okay. a music writer, too. Okay, awesome. So not everyone is going to love every single thing that you do. It's just impossible unless they were, like, manic and crazed, right? Right. <laughs> so you have to look at yourself objectively and think about it like that. You know, if I have a show and one of my jokes just doesn't do well, I can't say, oh, my God, what's wrong with me? There's something wrong with me. I'm awful. I'm horrible. Because that's just silly. Just because I don't like one of Madonna's songs doesn't mean Madonna is awful trash. It just means I didn't like that song. And maybe she needs to improve that song. So, you know, if I have a joke that just gets silence or crickets or no one's laughing, I get to look at it like what's wrong with the joke, not what's wrong with me. And I think that's very important for entertainers and artists and creative types and anyone creating. You know, even if you're a chef, if you're making a dish, not everyone is going to love every single dish you make. You know, if you make shrimp and someone's allergic to shrimp, well, they're not going to like that dish. And it has nothing to do with your talent and your skill and your craft. And so I, I take that energy from inside of myself, but that comes from my spirituality and that comes from the work I've done myself to a therapist and going to classes and learning about myself. And unfortunately, I that we need more of that in society because people are blaming and pointing the finger and, you know, getting mad at others and, and becoming more hostile and disconnected. And all of that has, has comes from not having, you know, a strong spirituality and a strong sense of self. And it's so important to cultivate. And I just really, really wish, you know, us as a society would start doing that more. So I really applaud you for going to a therapist. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How, uh, how sort of flexible do you always have to be when it comes to your material? How married to your material material are you? I would say I'm married about 50%. So <laughs> I have my general sense of what I'm going to say on stage and then things happen. You know, sometimes, you know, like I did a show the other night and it was an urban show. So the audience was supposed to be, you know, mostly African-American. And I showed up at the show and it was like all white people. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. So not that I do a different set of jokes for white people and black people, but I just know that. You know, when I do an urban crowd, they're going to get more references, you know, if I have certain jokes that are more geared to that audience. And like this was like white people, white people, like like <laughs> super white. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I was like, oh, my God, what happened? And it was funny because all the comedians were kind of, you know, the lineup was mostly you know, black and it was me and then one other Middle Eastern girl. And we were like, damn, the audience is white. <laughs> So, so even, you know, the black comedians were like, we need to change our material because I don't know if they're going to get all these references. Right. <laughs> so, so I had an idea of what I was going to do. And then when I got there, I kind of had a shift and then, you know, I do a little crowd work. I'm not crazy, crazy into crowd work, but I do do a little bit of crowd work and I do make fun of some of the audience a little bit. So I would say it was, it's about 50% material, you know, 50% improv and, and based off the audience and what's going on and what their reaction is and stuff like that. So, but, or maybe 50% material, 40% that, and then 10%, a little bit stream of consciousness, because sometimes I like to write jokes while I'm on stage, which is really fun. Right. Do you ever have any times when you just have some material that you written and you're like, all right, this is going to hit, this is going to hit. I love this. And it doesn't hit. How do you feel about that? And you know, what do you do about it? Yes. Yeah, so, so I never give up on a joke 
um, because, like I said, it's a craft. So I did a joke. Um, I had a big headlining show in Orange County, and I did a joke about people, you know, with kids um, scaring me away from having kids. And I thought my mind was going to be so funny because I I had told people about it, and they're like, oh, my God, that's so funny. And then I tried it on stage, and I could tell there was a lot of parents in the audience, and they found the concept of it offensive, right? So I'm still working on it, but, you know, just because something – does it hit? Does it mean it's not funny? And I've had jokes before where they kind of got a laugh, but it wasn't that funny. But after working on them and working on them and working on them, Kelly, you wouldn't believe sometimes you just change one word, one word, and the joke becomes funny. And you wouldn't think one word would change something from being not funny to funny. Does sometimes you just change one word and you say it a little bit different <laughs> and it makes and it makes it funny. And that's why it's a craft because you're 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 whittling away you know you're kind of like like a sculptor you're like whittling away the raw stone until it becomes a statue and and it's the same thing with comedians you know not just jokes it's the same thing with comedians there's people i met doing stand-up years ago and you know i'm i'm ashamed to say this but i thought this person is never going to be funny they're not funny they just need to give it up and for some reason they kept working and working and working and then something clicked in their head it just clicks, you know, one day sometimes for people. And I saw this one comedian who I just thought was awful. And I thought this guy needs to just get out of comedy. And I saw him and he was so funny. He blew my socks off. So just like an individual joke, a comedian can be crafted. And it really, really is a craft. It's not an art form. It's not It's not about talent because you really can learn to write a joke and you can learn to be funny. And I think, you know, if I can be a comedian, anyone can, because I was so shy growing up and I, you know, I didn't know anything about comedy. I don't think I even was, ever saw or went to a comedy show before I was in my twenties and I'm, you know, a comedian. So anyone can do it if you're smart and you're open-minded and you're willing to, to work on it. I think anyone can do it. How much of comedy is about perseverance? Oh, every hundred percent of comedy is about <laughs> perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> comedy is a high, you know, 99% perseverance, 1% talent. <laughs> because, because nobody, nobody knows that you're a funny comedian. If nobody knows who the heck you are. And some of the funniest comedians I know, unfortunately left the business because they couldn't deal with the business. They couldn't deal with how hard it was. They couldn't deal with the rejection and, and, you know, for their own mental health, they left, which I understand because if you can't shift your thinking, into not taking it personal it's it is very very difficult you know to deal with all the perceived rejection right like i said i don't consider it rejection it's just it's just you know the the audience telling you this wasn't funny right but some people perceive it as a severe internal rejection and so you know if you're i know so many funny guys that just couldn't stand it they could not stand the business they could not st stand the process and they left so you know, there are funny, funny guys, but nobody's going to know you're funny if you're not doing it. So it's, you know, 99% perseverance. Kind of in comparison to sort of like being out in public and just having small talk with some stranger at the coffee shop that you may never, ever see again in your life. How, how much does when you're first coming up as a comic, does word get around or does word get around about how much, you know, how green you are or does anybody even care at that time? Is it, you know, is there any sort of mind state that you should, you know, stay away from that? Hey, I may, I may suck right now, but, uh, a lot of people might not know. So I would say, um, there is a sign never, ever call yourself an up and coming, uh, not an upcoming an aspiring I, you know, I, I know so many people say, oh, I'm an aspiring comedian. That gives it a, a right away. Comedy is not about aspiring or comedian. You're either a comedian or you're not a comedian. And even if you suck, well, you're just a sucky comedian. <laughs> but, to, you know, to say that you're aspiring is kind of like saying, well, I want to be a comedian. Well, if you're getting up on the stage, you're a comedian. OK, if you're getting up and you're trying, you're a comedian. You are a comedian. You know, maybe you don't have fans yet. And maybe you're not funny yet, but you are a comedian. And so I would go get away from saying aspiring, you know, I'm an aspiring this, I'm an aspiring that you, you can't, you know, you're either pregnant or you're not, you know, you can't be an as, uh, aspiring to have a kid or whatever. That means you're not pregnant. So. <laughs> I'm an aspiring <laughs> mother. 
It's the same thing with music. If you're playing music, you're a musician. You know, <laughs> you're playing music. So I, I would stay away from that. And, uh, you know, the number one thing, a lot of young comics, the insecurity, you know, I think that is something that that comes with time being confident that you're funny. But really, a lot of young comics are so, so, so insecure. And um, what what I regret in my career is not being more confident earlier on, you know, which I think is something that you can build inside or even just faking it till you make it because I saw a lot of comedians surpass me in my career that weren't as funny as me, but they had that confidence, man. They had that confidence. I mean, they thought they were Robin Williams. They thought they were Jim Carrey. <laughs> and, and when you believe it, you know, it, it really is the law of attraction. If you believe it, other people start believing, believing it too. And, um, that's something that I, you know, I really learned the hard way. And there really is something as being too humble in Hollywood. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, uh, this person's famous and everything, but they still remain humble. You know, that's kind of a, a facade because if you are at the top, you you have a little bit of that that evil inside you, that ruthlessness. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, you know, celebrities on the top, they like to play the humble game. Like, oh, I'm so humble. But, you know, no, there's a the swagger top. there. There's a Yeah, you know, if they're at the top, they, they they're getting little shit little done. Yeah. You might not see it, but they're getting <laughs> shit done. So. So, yeah, I would I would stay away from the aspiring label and I would stay away from, you know, that insecurity. Oh, I suck. I'm, I'm so horrible because. I'm telling you, man, there was comics that a couple years deep, not that funny, but they had that swagger. They had that confidence and that took them further than any, you know, material or jokes or anything. So when you sort of uh, feel like there's these comics that are, you know, passing you by, how do you deal with that? Oh, so I'm so glad you asked me this because I just started dealing with it in a healthy way in the past few years. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Instagram is a killer. Facebook is a killer because we play the comparison game. And, you know, there are studies that shown that th those things actually create depression and, and anxiety more because we're comparing with each other. But yeah. I still got to go on the social media platforms because I have to promote myself and my brand. So something that I do is one of the reasons that I got into entertainment growing up is because I didn't see anyone that looked like me. And you had brought that up earlier. I did not see any Asian females. You know, it was like Margaret Tro and that's it. Right. <laughs> so I want, yeah, right. So I want. Yeah, Margaret Cho was the one, the 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 one that got through. That was the one. Like we're gonna let you through. Yeah, <laughs> you're the one. <laughs> you're the one. We're gonna let you through. No one else. No one else, right? So she was like the one, right? So I didn't see any faces like me. And when I was going to college, I I, I actually applied for an Asian American scholarship, and I I did an essay on on Asian women in entertainment. And as I was doing research for this essay to try to get the scholarship, which I didn't get, but as I was doing research, I found a statistic that Asian women have the highest suicide rate of any ethnic minority in the United States. Mm. And that devastated me. You know, I don't know if the statistic is still true in 2018, but back when I was in college, I found the statistic, That's which, was which was accurate at the time. And... One of the and what the study I read linked it to is the lack of um, identification in the media. So when you don't see someone like you out there, what the study was saying is that you then um, devalue yourself. Right. So if you're a black man and you don't see any black men in a positive role model, it you kind of internalize that. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I didn't. So because. So because, because in the Asian American community, there's very high pressure to succeed. You know, there's a lot of immigrant parents. So there's a very high pressure. Yet you're looking out there. You don't see no one. Right. You don't see no one. So it's very, very hard. So that was what was causing the suicide. So I thought I got to be a, a positive role model. Right. So back to what you said about what, what, you know, when you see people passing you up. So that was the reason I got into entertainment. So then, you know, now fl flash forward, there's a lot more Asian women in entertainment. And I see sometimes women passing me up, other Asian American actresses, other Asian, Asian American comedians, and I feel jealous. You know, I feel jealous just like anyone else. And they go, oh, that should be me, man. I've been working over 10 years on this. That should be me. And I get jealous. And then what I do is I do this amazing prayer. It's a Buddhist meditation. It's called the prayer for loving kindness. And what you do is you think of anyone that you have resistance to, anyone that you have negative energy to, and you wish them well, and you wish them love, and you wish them success. 
And what I found while I was doing this meditation and this prayer is that I can't be hating on these girls because they're helping me. They're helping me with my dream because if I want positive Asian female role models for people, it can't just be me. We need a bunch of them, right? Right, right. We need dozens of them. We need the more that they have success, the more they spread my goal and my dream to have these positive role models. So I can't be hating on them. I need to be wishing them love. And so through this, this positive meditation and prayer, I have found that when I, you know, hating on them is not going to do anything for me and being jealous of them is not going to do anything for me. In fact, it's going against my goal. My goal is to be a positive role model, Asian American role model for women. So they're helping me with their, you know, their goal. It's like when you're little and you go to the mall and you see Santa Claus and you're like, mom, how come Santa Claus is here? Isn't he supposed to be at the North Pole making my presents? And then your mom lies to you and says, well, honey, these are Santa's helpers. They're helping him. He's at the North Pole and this Santa Claus at the mall. He's like Santa's helper. Okay. (laughs) Right. So that's what I think of when I see people passing me up and getting success. I said, you know what? They're my helpers. They're helping me out right now because the more of them out there, the more women of color, the more minorities out there that are getting success, that's another chance for me. And even if I see someone that's not in a minority or not a whatever, if I see someone else that I came up with and they're having more success, you know, I don't get jealous. I think, you know what, if they can make it, I can make it because I came up with them. So I try to make it as a positive. Do I still get jealous? Yes, I'm human. Unfortunately, that's one of the human traits that we have is jealousy, insecurity, all these negative traits, right? But then when I turn it over and I look at the the positive side of it, it's all good. It's all good for me and it's all good for everyone. And most of the people that I would be jealous of are comedians. So, because they're in my same field, right? They're spreading joy and laughter. How can I hate on them? They're they're helping me with my message to spread joy and laughter. So, I just take all that jealousy and, and negativity and I say, hey, you, you know what? That's about me. That's my ego. And I look at it as a positive because really, the more joy, the more laughter. We can't have enough laughter in the society. We need more laughter with all the negative shit that's going on. So, I, I just wish them well. And that's something that I've learned in the past two or three years by doing this Buddhist meditation because before I was hating up and it was not good for me, you know? (laughs) Right. There's always been sort of this like myth that whether it comes from people's insecurities or certain people's white privilege or whatever, that certain people are taking other people's spots, but Mm -hmm. in all actuality, there's room for everybody. So there's really no, you know, room to hate on anybody. That's right. I totally agree with you. And not only that, but there are 7 billion people on this planet. All right. There's enough people to like everyone. You know, there's, there's, I think I, I, someone told me, you know, I was down one time and another comedian told me, he said, Rosie, there's like less than 10,000 comedians in the entire world. You're part of the elite. You're part of the top. You got to be proud of that. Not everyone can do what you do. And, and, you know, 10,000, I believe that. I think that statistic is accurate, 10,000, because just in L.A., there's a couple hundred, you know, maybe. I see the same people over and over again. And in New York, I know a lot of the New York community, there's really not that many people going out there trying to be a stand-up comedian. You know, that's so rare. <laughs> you know, maybe there's a couple people on YouTube. So I I really do believe that. There's 7.5, I think, billion people on this earth. There's enough, you know, even if every comedian had a million followers, there's still, you know, billions more. So I think there's enough room for everyone. Yeah, there's enough funny to go around. Yes, and like I said, we need more funny. We need to spread love. We need to spread joy. We need to spread happiness. You know, there's just too much negativity going on right now. So, you know, the more comedians, the better. I'm fine with it. Being that you're an Asian woman in this really male-dominated industry, which is getting better. There's more, like you said, there's more and more women, more Asian women that are in, you know, the comedic industry. How do you sort of deal with though, any of the times when that sort of male toxic, toxic male insecurity, that sort of misogyny sort of, you know, creeps in into your world. You know what? It's gotten so much better. It's gotten so much better. And I really think that just more people of different colors and ethnicities and genders and whatever, just trying stand up, I think that will help. And I think it will take time. Um, 
I haven't had an incident in many, many years, but when I started, Kelly, it was toxic. It was toxic. Really, I'm not kidding you. When I came up, the kind of frat boy humor was really in. Right. It was like so many just angry white males, misogyny. You know, I did a show at one time. I think I've told this story before on another podcast, but I'll share it with your listeners. I did a show one time. It was a bar show in Hollywood, and I was the only female and only minority on the show. It was all white males. Every single male, every single male in the show had a joke degrading Asian women. I mean, I'm telling you, Asian women are whores. I fucked this one Asian chick. She didn't speak English, blah, blah, blah. It was like every single comedian. And I was in the back, and I really did feel humiliated and awful. And I was last. I wasn't the headliner. You know, sometimes you go last, and you're like the main act, the headliner. But I was just last because I was last. And it was like God, you know, I I wasn't that religious at the time or spiritual at the time, but it was like God came down on me and said, this is happening to you for a reason. I mean, really, every single comedian on the show has a joke about degrading Asian women. This is a little bit much, right? So I just went on stage and I said something, but I was, I wasn't going to say anything about it. I was just going to do my act and do my thing. But you know, the first thing I did is I went up on stage and said, man, Asian women are really taking it up the butt in this comedy show, huh? <laughs> and the audience went crazy because they noticed it too. And the <laughs> audience was majority, you know, Caucasian, but they were like, kind of like, what's going on too, you know? Right. <laughs> They're like, what's going on with these angry ass white dudes? <laughs> you know? So I started making fun of it because that's how I deal as a comedian. I started making fun of it. I said, man, a lot of, I, I think these guys got rejected by some Asian chicks. And I started, you know, making fun of it. And not only did it kind of purify me, you know, I didn't go there. I didn't make fun of them personally and, and say, you know, fuck you. What's wrong with you? You losers. You know, I, I made it into a, a silly thing and a positive and I made light of it to bring attention and awareness to it, which I did. And, I made it into a fun thing. And that was the day, you know, I I felt like God was like shining a light on me. Like there's a reason that this is happening to you. And it taught me, it was one of my biggest comedy lessons to, you know, I'm a comedian. That's my job. So I need to turn it into a fun thing. And that doesn't mean that I belittle and demean what happened to me. And I don't, you know, take, bring awareness to it. I brought awareness by making fun of it. And maybe those men that were on that show that night, you know, heard what I said, and maybe they were brought some awareness too, as far as their material is concerned. So you can't change everyone, but you can make a ripple. And so that night I did make a ripple. And, you know, not all of my material is positive and, you know, bringing light to things and everything. I do make fun of things myself, and I'm sure I've offended someone along the way in my, you know, years of doing comedy. But <laughs> it was it was my way of kind of bringing light to the misogyny and the racism. And, and the audience was with me. You know, the audience was majority Caucasian. And they were like, yeah, what is going on with these guys? <laughs> Recently, I uh, was listening to the audio book of um... – Eliza Schlesinger's uh, book. I forget the name of it, but she was telling a story about how, you know, she would go on to these promo runs doing these morning shows and always be some derpy host be like, Hey, how's it, how's it like being a hot chick in comedy? Totally like, you know, dismissing her story, all the years that, that she's put in, you know, for, for you or for any sort of, you know, woman that wants to be a part of, of, of comedy, you know, how do you feel like you should be able to, uh, bring the focus back to what your story is, like the important things about who you are. So that's very, very hard. And that goes back to the story I just told you about making light of the situation. You know, I wish I would have had that knowledge early on. And I had a similar situation as Eliza. And I don't think I probably didn't deal with it as well as she did. You know, I was doing a radio show to promote a gig I was doing in Washington state. And I had a DJ guy like that. And he, but he wasn't even as, friendly as that saying oh what is it like to be a woman in comedy he was just saying i don't think women are funny i don't think women are he you know and i was very very young and naive and i was humiliated on the air you know he just what he wanted now that i know more about comedy and i have a little bit more worldly experience 
is those guys kind of need to be put in their place in a funny way. You know, they're kind of used to that East Coast humor, the the yo mama type of humor. And so they need to be put in their place with something like, I don't know, what does it feel like to be an ugly D, you know, DJ <laughs> or radio? D- you know what I'm saying? Like they need to be put in their place in a funny way. And that's kind of what they're expecting. So I really don't think a lot of these guys realize how insulting what they're doing is. They're just used to kind of like that, you know, bro type of yo mama humor and they kind of want you to to show well i'm funny you know so you need to shut your mouth or what they kind of want you to put them in their place and i really i really don't think that their intention is even though you know what they're doing is dehumanizing and insulting but you know i I would i would have now that i have more experience and understanding just kind of in a funny way, put them in their place and be like, I'm trying to tell a story. Okay. It's, it's jerks like you that make it hard to be a hot, funny female comedian, you know? So you got to kind of throw it back on them. And that's something that takes experience to kind of learn. And it's something that, you know, unfortunately I didn't learn until the past few years. And I have dealt with that as well. And I think every female comedian has dealt with a guy like that. So in this sort of time when we're going through like these movements, like time's up me too. And you have a lot of, uh, people a lot of you know men who are sort of now confused or angry about you know what can they do and they're throwing up the politically correctness you know argument um how do you how do you sort of deal what's your views about that because sometimes i feel like when people bring up the pc argument they're just like rationalizing shitty behavior but how do you feel about all of that and how you know how men should be uh you know sort of a part of this movement so, Kelly, are you talking about men saying that it's too PC, that PC-ness is taking over comedy? Is that what you're discussing? Yes. 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 Okay. So, um, you know, unfortunately, I think that a lot of men view the Me Too movement and these women's movements as, like you said earlier, you know, there's enough for everyone. They see it as an attack on them. And so they don't think that their type of humor can be funny if female centric comedy can be funny. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. So I think that's where that, that mentality of, Oh, we're getting too PC and Oh, you know, whatever. Um, I think these movements are awesome. And I think they're, they're, you know, well, you know, should have happened, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But I also think that it's very important to understand what the movement is. So the movement is about, women wanting equality and that equality includes freedom to express yourself without sexual harassment. Right. Right. And so I think that's very important. And unfortunately I'm very, you know, I, I love the movement, but I do also as a woman and someone who's been sexually assaulted and raped, I think that, you know, they need, it needs to be taken seriously. And I do think that there are some women that cry wolf and that that hurts the movement. You know, you know, like I that that story recently came out about a, a season sorry and the girl said, well, you know, it sounded like she she had sex with him, but then she regretted it. Well, that's not sexual assault and that's not sexual harassment and that's not rape. Right. That's just making a shitty decision and just cu- and regretting it. So I think we need to draw a very very clear line because those types of stories actually empower the men who are saying, oh, this is PC you know, bullshit and it's gone too far. Those types of stories empower them, you know, being groped. Oh, this guy touched my butt. Well, my husband has, 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 has had his butt touched in the New York city subway. You know, everyone's had their butt touched. If you've been to a festival or a music festival or been on a train, you've had your butt touched if you're a guy or a girl. So I think we really need to take this serious, you know, and be very serious about it. You know, sexual harassment, um, rape, you know, intimidation. These are very serious issues that women have to deal with on a daily basis. And I I do think that these women that cry wolf empower the men that say, oh, this is PC bullshit. And so it's not just about men being part of the movement and and really becoming conscious and aware of of the entitlement, but it's also women being aware of the movement. And, you know, just because, you know, someone touched your butt, yes, that's inappropriate. And that's unwanted and people need to respect boundaries. But, you know, you know, everyone and their mama saying, well, you looked at me the wrong way or you did or you did that. 
that's kind of empowering those men. And so I think that we need to focus on what the real movement is. And the real movement here is that we need to be treated equally. And so I think that men can can definitely help by supporting women and supporting their friends that have experienced this. And, you know, there's always going to be guys that, that make comments and, 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 and do that, this and that, that can't be stopped. You know, people are assholes. Sometimes it's not about sexual harassment. It's not about, you know, being a woman. It's just some people are jerks. You know what I mean? (laughs) Right. And they, you know, if they were a woman or a man or a trans or whatever, they would still be an asshole. It doesn't, you know, so we really need to focus on what the movement is about. And that's equality and respect and, and not, you know, give in to these frivolous claims on the female side and on the male side, this frivolous comments. And we need to focus on what's really important. So I do support the movement. I am a member of the movement. I've been sexually harassed and raped and they're very, very serious things and they shouldn't be taken lightly. And, um, I, I don't like the media covering some of these frivolous stories because, you know, I heard, you know, I mean, friends, I, I heard when the season, sorry, thing came out and they just said, well, this, you know, this girl, she just made a bad decision. Why is she talking about me too? You know, he didn't really do anything. Right. So I, I, I don't think those stories help. And I would appreciate, you know, the, if those stories were not featured because it kind of makes fun of the me too movement. It's a little bit, you know, making fun of women and say, Oh, look, they just complained about everything. And that's not, what this movement is about. This movement is about, you know, if you listen to those Harvey Weinstein tapes on YouTube, he was using real intimidation and aggression and, and those serious, serious issues need to be addressed. So I think, you know, men can support by supporting their friends and their, I, I I don't even understand what men don't support because every man has sisters, wives, mothers, you know, friends, you 50% of the population is female. How can you not know someone, you know? So that's just shocking to me. Right, definitely. It's it's one of those things where you're just like, look, you know, you know a woman. Like you came from a woman. <laughs> you gotta know someone, right? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. You didn't just appear out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate you asking about it, you know, and asking uh, asking about it because it's really important and it's important for men to to get that information and get that knowledge, but also the females, you know, I don't like every woman, you know, Oh, this guy touched me back in 1989. I was drunk. He was drunk and he touched my shoulder. It's like, okay, lady, come on, stop. Yeah, <laughs> You're sometimes it, our movement. Yeah, sometimes it was just really bad drunk behavior. You were drunk. They were drunk. You started hooking up. Yeah. And you can't, and a day later you can't be like, Oh, that, you know, me too. Hashtag me too. It's like, you just made a bad decision, lady. <laughs> Right, but right. yes, but that, but I do, you know, I definitely do not condone rape, rape as a victim myself. I don't, you know, there's a difference between I made a bad mistake and hey, this guy was too aggressive, and I said no. And I think it's very important to make make that distinction because, you know, it's important to take responsibility for our actions. And I have definitely, you know, slept with a couple guys I regret, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I think and everybody did. <laughs> yeah, that's everyone, right? And I definitely take responsibility for that. And as an adult, and I say, hey, that was a regret. And then when I was sexually assaulted, that was a different situation. So I think it's very important to make that distinction and for women to make that distinction. Because if you're crying wolf, that you know does empower men to um, look down on the movement and to uh, – and I don't think that that many women cry wolf. I think that the majority of people – that come forward, you know, they have nothing to gain from coming forward. Oh, definitely. You're right. And that their, their allegations should be taken seriously. And, you know, I definitely think that there's a lot of women that come forward and actually, you know, lose face by coming forward because they're humiliated and embarrassed. So, and like I said, as a victim myself, I, I definitely, but I, I have heard a couple stories in the media lately of women that, you know, it seems like they're kind of just getting attention. And I don't like that Kelly, because they're hurting us. They're hurting the movement. Oh, Definitely, definitely. No, it's it's. If someone comes out, if if a woman comes out with these allegations, you know, you, you tend to believe them because they're gonna get so much scrutiny. They're gonna get so much stuff from people online, death threats. So much crap's gonna be thrown at them. So there's really no there's really no there's plus no for them to uh, to really come out, even because most of the, a lot of times most of the allegations don't end up going anywhere. Except for, you know, that person might lose their career, you know, and not be able to, you know, have the luxury of, you know, 
being the, the actor that they are, you know, because they have the shitty behavior. But no one, you know, there's not a lot of these people that are going to jail or getting, you know. They're not. They're yeah. not going to jail. Yeah. So. So there's there's little to gain from it. So when you do have these women who are, you know, crying wolf, you know, a lot of times you hope like it gets debunked really quickly, you know, because it is hurting the movement. Yes, I don't. I don't like it at all. But I. It's, you know, it's a touchy subject. It's a touchy subject. And I feel, I feel sorry, who, who I feel sorry for are not the women that are coming forward who are in entertainment because they're getting all this publicity. What I feel sorry for are the, the average ladies, you know, who work in an office or who work in a, and they've been harassed and they're getting no publicity from it. They're getting nothing. They just suffer, you know? And so they're, it's like they, they have to suffer in silence and maybe they're still at that job, you know? There was a big scandal at Microsoft that there was all these women that came, you know, to HR and Microsoft swept it under the rug. And some of these women had to still work with the guys. Right. Yeah. There's a there it seemed like there was a, a lot of that going on in like Silicon Valley, that sort of bro culture that was going on in Silicon Valley. Yes. And they had to still work with the guy. Can you imagine being harassed and hu- hum- humiliated and intimidated and then to still have to see the person every day? Oh, Oof. It's awful, awful. Awful. Yeah. Yeah, before we get out of here, I definitely wanted to bring up uh, the podcast that you do. Uh, you do uh, the Out of the Box podcast, and then you also do the Hello Crypto Kitty. Um, talk about those. Sure. So Out of the Box podcast was something that I created um, out of my frustration with comedy because I was doing comedy. And even though comedy is something that you can control because you can always get funnier and work on your jokes and stuff, your career is sometimes something that you can't control because, you know, like I said, there's so many funny people I know and, and it just seems like some people get really lucky and get, you know, blow up and others. I know people that have been working for 20 plus years who are so funny and, you know, they're still struggling. So I felt like I had, you know, no control over that aspect of my life and I really wanted to bring more positive messages. So I created Out of the Box podcast to bring out of the box voices and, you know, that's everyone, you know, I have porn stars on the show. I have happiness advisors. I have religious people, spiritual leaders, entrepreneurs. So you can be on, you know, my podcast, whoever you are out there, as long as you have a positive uplifting message to bring, because I really want to inspire people and, and bring more, you know, joy and light to the world. So it was an extension of my comedy as far as bringing joy and light, but it was, it was kind of born out of my frustration with my career. Like, Hey, what do I do next? I've been doing comedy for 10 plus years and I've been funny and like, nothing's really happening (laughs) or (laughs) things have been happening here and there, but you know. I'm definitely not Kevin Hart level, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I started it as an as another outlet, and you know, all of my guests, you know, are positive and bringing messages, inspiring messages. And then Hello Crypto Kitty came out of I was on Esther Ku's podcast. She's another Asian female comedian, and um, she has a podcast called Ku and the Gang, and I was a gu- it's a comedy podcast, and I was a guest on it. And um, we found out that we both have a love for cryptocurrency and alternative currency and investing, and and so we started the podcast as a silly, you know, light podcast to talk about cryptocurrency news. And uh, I'm very, very, very passionate about cryptocurrency. I, I really think it's going to revolutionize the way we do banking and finance. And, you know, there's kind of like this freedom and liberty part of it where – you're taking the hands out of like the big evil corrupt corporate banks and you're putting it into the hands of the people. So I love cryptocurrency and I, I definitely love interviewing uh, positive guests for my show. So it's out of the box podcast. Right. Yeah. I, I need to check out the uh, hello crypto uh, kitty podcast. Cause I have like a close friend who is totally into the cryptocurrency, the blockchain technology. He was an early adopter in, into it all. He stays out in uh, Atlanta now, and anytime he tried to like explain it to me, it just went right over my head. <laughs> <laughs> it still so the, does today. <laughs> so the easiest way to explain cryptocurrency, which I didn't understand. So when I got into it, I really, really didn't understand it. I just thought, hey, this is a way for me to like put some money on the side and like invest and like get a return on my money. And I was also an early adopter. I've been, you know. I had talked about crypto on my cur- currency podcast, some uh, cryptocurrency on my podcast five years ago. And, but I really, I understood it on a very superficial level and I really didn't understand it. So the easiest way to understand it is it's the internet of money. 
So it's like the internet. Okay. And you can build platforms on top of it. You can build money platforms on top of it. So a lot of people think of it as a currency. It's really not a currency. It's a network. It's a cryptocurrency network. And um, I think that it's very confusing that it's understood as a – it can be used as an exchange of money. And, and it can be used to buy goods and services. That's one of the applications on the network. So I think it's very, very confusing to people because they're like, is it a money? Is it a But it really is a network that's verified by the network, just like the internet. So you can build financial applications on top of it. You can build something like a PayPal, like a Venmo. You can build a contract, like a mortgage contract, a insurance contracts. So I think once people understand it more, you know, we still are in the early phases, Kelly, of the cryptocurrency market. You know, the majority of people still don't understand it. They don't know what it is. Um, Andres Antonopoulos, who's considered Bitcoin Jesus, I read his <laughs> book. And once I read his book, I now, even though it's been down as far as the numbers of investing, um, I'm into it more than ever. Like, I'm like a diehard. Like, after reading his book, I'm like, oh, my God, this is where the future is going to be. Like, we're like in the Internet in like 1990 right now with crypto. And after I read his book, I'm like 100 percent in. Right. This whole time I'm like, all right, how can I use this in my own life? And can I go to the record store and buy some records? Like, that's like <laughs> Yes, you will be able to. But I just think right now it's so early. It's like the Internet. It's like the Internet in the 90s. And everything they're saying about crypto now, they said about the Internet in the 90s. It's a scam. It's for pornographers. It's not It's not going to work. And Andres' book, um, Andres Antonopoulos, who's considered Bitcoin Jesus, he explains all of it. And the way he explains it is very, very simple where anyone can understand. And once you understand it, the way he explains it, you're like, oh, my God, this is like going to blow up once it gets mainstream. And it really isn't mainstream yet it, like, because even though the prices went up, I mean, that doesn't mean it's mainstream. That just means that, you know, I think a lot of Wall Street money poured into it. But I think once the average Joe understands, oh, OK, I can put this app on my phone that's running on the Ethereum network and I can like buy a cheeseburger or I can, you know, you know it, it's I, I really don't think the financial services industry and the insurance industry understands what it is because if they did, they would try to shut it down so hard because it's going to revolutionize their industry and the profits for all these big companies is really going to go down and it's going to be more democratized. So I would look into it, Kelly, do research. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try again, try to do some research uh, before. Yeah. Before we get out of here on um, if, if there was any sort of a nugget of advice something that you can sort of extract from your life and career that you could tell to anybody listening to this podcast, whether they are into comedy or not, you know, what would that be? I would say work on yourself. If I would have worked on myself sooner and earlier and had all the knowledge that I have now, work on yourself. If you can't get a girlfriend or boyfriend, work on yourself. If your career is not going where it wants to be, work on yourself. What does that mean? It means investing in yourself, reading, taking workshops, educating yourself. I'm not talking about traditional education. I'm not talking about college. I'm talking about go out there and learn about all the information that's out in the world. Listen to podcasts that, you know, go to workshops. I can't, I cannot emphasize workshops enough because a lot of us are nerds and we're book readers and we read books and we have the knowledge in our brain, but going to workshops, you get to network with like-minded people. You get to get out of your comfort zone by doing something different. And I would encourage everyone to do that. I would encourage people to take personal development workshops. I would encourage people to get out of their comfort zone because right now the world is a hot mess. And part of that hot mess is you. Yes, you listening to the podcast. I know people <laughs> don't want to hear that they're the hot mess. But guess what? When we say society is messed up, who is society, Kelly? I am society. You are society. We are part of society. Right. And so the only way, you know, it's fun to wish that all these people would change. But guess what? They're not going to. You need to change. You know, there's this amazing Rumi quote. Rumi is a, I think he's like 12th century poet. And he says, yesterday was naive. I was naive. I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise. I know I need to change myself. We are the change. We are the inspirers, the, you know, the, 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 we are part of society. And so the only advice I have for people is work on yourself. Look in the mirror constantly. Your upbringing may have been messed up. Where you grew up may have been messed up. 
society may be messed up, the government may be messed up, but you can make a difference by changing yourself and working on yourself. And then you will become that role model and that ripple through society. So that's the message I would have. <laughs> See, everything you just said is just is literally me right now in a nutshell. <laughs> yes, right? You and it's and people think they can change the world. And it, you can, but you have to change yourself first. It's like the airplane thing, you know, put on your oxygen mask before you help others. And people are going around there. They're a hot mess and they're thinking they can change the world. No, you got to change yourself. You got to change yourself. Right, definitely. And uh, before we get out of here, uh, there is a question that I always end all my podcasts with uh, that, you know, I gave to you ahead of time to think about. Who is somebody that's been a part of your life or career that I could realistically interview that would have some great stories or lessons to talk about? You know, I'm going to recommend, um, I was going to recommend someone else. So I'm not going to say who it is because I don't want them to be sad that I'm changing my mind. But I'm going to change my mind and recommend the last guest I had on my podcast, Arno Collery. He's a former stand-up comedian. And he uh, now is a happiness officer. And he goes around preaching happiness and teaching happiness to people all over the world. And I'm going to recommend him because I think he would love to do your show. And he's a very, very positive person. He has a positive message. And I did have someone else in mind, but I just switched real quick because I think that this person could bring a little bit more value to your podcast. Great. Yeah, I did actually uh, listen to that episode of your podcast and I did enjoy him. Yes. And he's very, very positive. So I think that, you know, just kind of listening to my own hype, I'm like, you know what? The world needs more love and positivity. I'm going to recommend this guy. He's a little bit more positive than the other person I was going to recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. All right. Before we get out of here, uh, where can people go online to check out, you know, all the stuff you're doing in your podcast and whatnot? So I'm on Twitter at funny Rosie and I'm on Instagram at out of the box Rosie. And my podcast is out of the box podcast and it's on iTunes, Stitcher and SoundCloud and hello. Crypto kitty is on YouTube. Awesome. It's been, it's been great talking with you. A lot of, you know, great stories, a lot of great knowledge. It was, it was a blast talking with you. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. And I'm so happy that you're working on yourself. More people need to do that. And I'm sure that you've discovered so much from doing it. Oh, I definitely have. Yes. So everyone, listen to me and Kelly. You guys need to work on yourselves. <laughs> Society's a hot mess and we need help. <laughs> definitely. Thanks for uh, talking with me. Thanks, Kelly. Have a great day. You too. All right, bye. So that was my interview with Rosie Tron. Links to her website and social media are listed in the show notes for this episode on freshofthepodcast.com. Now let's get on to the Fresh of the Word, Fresh Pick of the Week. This episode's pick is the new album from Japanese metalcore band Cross Faith, titled Ex Machina. In a world saturated with metalcore bands, Cross Faith has that it factor that makes them larger than life both in their music and on stage. Fusing elements of electronic and hip-hop music through heavy metal, Cross Faith has an edge that is undeniable and have long become one of the bands to break out of Japan to be known worldwide. With Ex Machina, Cross Faith tackled the ideas of individuality in a world consumed with technology. Links to follow Cross Faith and to purchase and stream the new album Ex Machina are in the show notes at freshofthepodcast.com. And before we get out of here, definitely want to give a shout out to Knox Money, Bang Belushi, and Foulmouth for the theme music of Fresh of the Word. And then I definitely want to remind you how you can support the podcast. You can always go to freshofthepodcast.com and share any links that you see on the website on any of your social media platforms. You can also subscribe to Fresh of the Word on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Mixcloud, Google Play, and TuneIn. Just uh, search Fresh of the Word. It'll come up. Hit the subscribe button, hit the follow button, whatever. And if you can, please rate and review the podcast. That would definitely help help me out, help out the show. And if I do see any reviews, I'll definitely read them on the, the show. And you can follow me online at Twitter and Instagram at Kelly Omega Fresh and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash KFresh. And you can follow Fresh of the Word online on Twitter at FITW Podcast, on Instagram at Fresh of the Word Podcast and on Facebook at facebook.com slash fresh of the podcast. So that's another episode in the books. Thanks for listening. Goodbye and good night. Fresh, 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 fresh is the word.